Okay, hello everybody, welcome back. Um, it's Ivan here again with the fifth lecture in deep learning for NLP. Uh, I hope you enjoyed the last two lectures from uh, Mohsen on backpropagation and then on work to work, and we'll be extending work to work today with uh, more topics on, on embeddings, and in particular, we'll be talking about uh, bilingual or multilingual embeddings and also like embeddings based on uh, syntactic or some other semantic uh, information. My name is Ivan Habernal and I really appreciate uh, your comments back on the f uh, on the first couple of lectures so uh, thanks a lot it's uh, really appreciated. If you have any other questions or comments just put them here or open the issue on the github page or just reach us via Moodle or other um, Discord channels, for example. So as I said, we'll be talking about multilingual word embeddings, then about syntactic word embeddings, and then a category called uh, miscellaneous, so some uh, putpuri or collection of things that don't belong anywhere, and but they are still have something to do on embeddings. So we could call it embeddings too today. Um, a little bit of word senses uh, or some something more from linguistics although this is not like linguistics course so but something which we know from common sense so words as we know them in the text they don't represent only one meaning and this uh, phenomenon is known general as a polysemy or homonymy and word may have many different meanings and i'm pretty sure you know all these examples for example a table which we have here could be a table of a piece of furniture or could be just a table and as an excel sheet and many different uh, meanings or senses the same for example for the bank and uh, the bank could be a institution it could be uh, a river bank it could be a um, what else a, uh, you know a place to sit on and so on and so on so there is no surprise here uh, another example of um, of polysemy is a uh, is the word man. This is sort of special because we have the first uh, the first sense is this is the human species. So, for example, uh, man or versus other organism. Uh, then it's basically a, a male of the human species. So, man versus women. And the third example is uh, it's actually or the sense is actually adults uh, of the human species, so you know, a boy or a man. And this example shows one specific polysemy where we have the same word used at uh, different levels of a taxonomy, which means uh, example one actually contains uh, this sense and it also contains this sense. So it's a sort of, if you have a taxonomy of senses, this would be in part of taxonomy. Anyway, so, um, Last time we were talking about word to vec and the word to vec is nice, but it doesn't take any senses into account. It just rain, uh, just runs on plain text words. And these words might have different senses as just we saw. So one natural extension of that could be, well, what if we train word vectors, for example, word to vec on sense disambiguated corpus? And here's an example sentence, uh, and it reads like a rush of panic called Sara. So it uh, seems like it's coming from a, from a drama book. Here's an example of the same sentence from the so-called uh, Semcor corpus. And as you see, it's just an XML form of these words, a rush of panic called Sara, with some additional information. And these information are the most important for us are now the word sense and here it's just an index to some uh, word sense uh, dictionary or word sense inventory so we would know having this inventory we would know which sense is that and you know we have other information here as well such as part of speech tag and we have the lemma which is the uh, the vocabulary uh, version of that word basically the word which you find in the vocabulary so, for example, for rush, uh, the lemma is rush, and it's a, uh, it's a noun. For caught, of course, uh, the lemma is the catch, it's a verb. And here can, we can see, like, the, 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 the verb here, uh, the sense here is number 12. So, catch has many different senses, of course, many different meanings as well. So, the main idea here 
is to take a sentence and provided we have this sort of uh, this ambiguity representation to convert it into something that we just append the sense. And when I call about sense disambiguation, it means that we actually disambiguate it. So the words are ambiguous because they have different senses, but we identified or the creator of the corpus identified the sense of that and assigned that and disambiguated the word. So this is like a shortcut version of the corpus. There is much more information there, but it's important for our argument. So now let's say we have this, uh, this corpus and we train word, word vectors on this corpus. And what happens then, uh, if you remember some examples of, uh, from word to -wack, where we show the similar words or the most, the, the most neighboring words uh, in the space of word to -wack. Here, we have the examples of the sense disambiguated words. And this means, the, uh, for example, the bank here. Um, this shows this is a noun and this shows the sense. So sense here again. So all of the, all of them are nouns basically here in this example. There could be, for example, uh, to bang could be a verb as well. But we have nouns here in here. What different senses? So sense to and so on. And here you could see that for the geographical notion of bank, we have some similar words such as upstream, downstream, runs, and something which is something to do with the flow of the river or river bank. And here. In the bank number two, the financial institution, we do see the neighboring words are commercial bank or financial institution, national bank, and so on. So here we clearly see the neighboring words are uh, take do take into account the uh, the sense of the word. So this is taken from from the 2015 um, ACL paper from Jakobacci, Pilehavar, and Roberto Navi. But now you might be wondering, okay, so it's quite obvious, but what is the big advantage of word to wack as compared to the sense disambiguated embeddings as we just saw? And the word to wack basically runs on uh, unlabeled data set. It only needs a plain text. What we saw right here was a very special sense disambiguated corpus and you know as you might guess creating these corpora on large scale it's uh, it's doesn't scale it has to be manually done or semi-automatically so how can we train how can we make a you know some better approximation of that without all these manual uh, requirement for this such a such a corpus and here's a trick we can try to employ um, so let's take a corpus uh, as we as we had for word to wack uh, plain text, and we run word to wack on the data and compute embeddings as we know. Then for each target word, we will represent its context as an average or concatenation of the embeddings. So we go through the example right now. We have uh, one, two, three, four sentences here, or five, four words where we are interested in the word bank again. So we are the target words. And we will take the context and compute the, uh, the embeddings as I'll just show in the next slide. So again, the context of the target words are to go to, to get some and so on. So basically we here we have four contextual words. And we take the embeddings such as, so let's say we have here the words are the embeddings, so I'm drawing the vectors here. Uh, oh, okay, all eight of them here. And we might take an average, so we sum them up and then divide by the number of them, which is eight, and we'll get some uh, vector of context of this word. And we'll do it for each sentence here. So what we get is as I said, some vectors um, for each of the context of the target word. So here, for example, it would be, I'm just, you know, pointing, uh, I'm just, uh, you know, th these are fables, these don't exist, making them, I'm just making them up. And uh, this could be 0 0.2 or 0 0.8. 
and here is 0 0.4, 0 0.6, here minus something, minus something, and minus something, minus something. So, and this is only in two dimensions. Typically, we would have the, uh, the embeddings in hundreds of dimensions, such as work to wake would be 300 dimensions. But just to show the, the main argument, main idea of the paper, of this approach is that we have these uh, contexts of the target words in two dimensions and we can maybe you know plot them and and cluster them so we would have these two guys would be um, okay well let's do it properly these two guys would be two point something so somewhere here you know would be these as we can see these two, uh, two first um, contexts are somehow related to the, to the bank institution, while these two other, what is larger bank and so on, are related to, to actual river bank. So the first two would be somewhere here, and then the second two would be maybe in, in here. Then we can use some unsupervised technique uh, for clustering. So if you remember from, from machine learning class, clustering is uh, such as k-means is unsupervised, provided you have some, some vector space of, of your instances. So here we can cluster, you know, create some cluster, and then we would assign each target word, each word's context to a cluster. So here, It'd be, for example, cluster one, and this would be cluster two. So then we would take this context as some unsupervised cluster, uh, as a sense cluster, and assign back to the word. So this would be bank one, bank one, but this would be bank two, and here as well, bank two. So through this contextualized clustering, we are actually creating something similar to the SEM corpus, you know, to something which we already know the senses for each word. And then having these for each target word, so remember it's for each target word, not only for the bank, so for all of them, full vocabulary, you would run word to wake again on this sense semi semiquity corpus. So it's pretty cool idea. We don't need again any any supervision here. We just run uh, word to wake two times and some clustering in between, and we get something closer to to the sense disambiguated corpus, which we don't have in the first place. But that's the catch. So it's promising approach. It's unsupervised, which is very cool, but we have a super high cost because you need to run the sense labeling for each target word and the, the model is more complicated. And nowadays it's basically hard to use in practice because it's just too, too complex and too, too compute intensive. And after some contextualized models such as Elmo and Bert came around a couple of years back, um, the community switched to contextualized word embeddings, which we'll be talking about later. But what is important about this example is um, uh, the clever solution about finding you know, approximation of the word senses and, and their disambiguation, and also to show that word disambiguation embeddings are important in some contexts where really you have the polysemy problem. So let's leave sense embeddings for a while and move to something uh, more interesting because we're not dealing with only one language, but with maybe two languages or multi multiple languages at once. And we'll start with bilingual embeddings first. And the idea is that we want to represent the word in, in two languages. So we start training the corpus uh, on single language first and we get some uh, word embeddings for corp, uh, for language A and for language B. So this would be English and German. And this is our starting point. What we really want to have at the end is that uh, words from differing languages are somewhere closer in the space as they would be in, in, uh, in just a single language as we know from, for example, from word to wec So here, for example, we want to have in the in the multi or the bilingual embedding space to have uh, Fata and uh, Oma and Opa and Chal and Man 
closer to each other than, for example, to eat or uh, drink or twinken, gobble, and so on. So this is the idea. How do we get there? Well, we need to satisfy two objectives at once. And the first objective is the, the cross-lingual objective, which is that words that are translations of each other should be close in the projected space. The second objective is again the old one, basically it's a monolingual objective. So the words that occur in monolingually similar contexts, so it comes from the, from the idea of, of neighborhood of words, should be close to each other in the vector space. So we know this already, this is the old objective. This is the new objective because we want to work it over languages. And why could be this important or even beneficial for us having bilingual embeddings? So one example is that the second language is some additional signal. So it may help us to improve the word embeddings in our first language. So if you like first language and the second language, then we take the second language as some su external supervision to improve our monolingual embeddings better. So for example, assume we have a word like uh, opa, which is very infrequently in the German corpus. And this is like a first corpus will be the German. And because it's infrequent, it would be hard to learn uh, enough statistics and to compute reliably the word embedding. But now let's say the English translation grandfather, it's very much often and very much frequent in the English corpus. So we might utilize this uh, English corpus to learn better embeddings of the German word and you know, get some, some transfer from the second corpus, from the English one, to help us with the first one. Another advantage would be, uh, maybe the, the more common I would say nowadays, that if the words are projected in a common space, so they have some shared features, such as the shared context, we might, uh, we might have uh, something called direct transfer. So basically it means that we have a, some downstream task for which we need to train a model. And we can train a model in one language Typically, this one language would be something where we have a lot of resources. So, for example, we have um, lots of labeled data for sentiment analysis in English, and we would train a model for sentiment analysis in English, and then we would simply swap the embeddings uh, at the beginning of the model through the German embeddings, or basically use not swapping. But we would be basically using the bilingual embeddings completely from the you know from the uh, even for the training of the model. And we would directly apply them in another language, which could be, for example, German. And we can consider it as resource poor in terms of the task we're interested in. And the main benefit is that we have a model trained in one language already, and we can just directly transfer it to another where we don't have these resources to train a model in the first place. I mean, we're paying a cost for that, of course, because the direct transfer, there is some, some drop in the performance expected, but just consider having this advantage versus having to, to build a corpus in the second language from scratch, which might be super time consuming or even impossible. So this is real, a real advantage of bilingual embeddings. Here we visualize one in our, ex uh, in our example of this direct transfer and the task would be here, not document classification such as sentiment analysis, but uh, something more um, low level such as part of speech tagging. So we're interested in part of speech tagging and we have English training corpus. So this is English training and this is labeled. So we have, for example, a sentence, I may not drink this, which is a pronoun, uh, a verb, particle, verb, and the reminder. And for the test time, we want to predict part of speech uh, text for sentence is wichtig, ausreichend zu trinken. Uh, how do we do that? So one idea could be uh, using a simple model that we take the center word and the context words and we want to output the label of the center word. So one example would be if our word we want to predict would be drink, we take a context such as not drink this and we want to predict uh, the associated part of speech. 
and we do it in in the you know in the language one where we have the training data uh, and for the prediction for the test we would utilize the context learn here so we would have some common words here and this would help us to do this transfer and maybe learn something uh, from the first language and being able to apply it here so for example you know predicting that this is a, a verb as well so here's a quick summary of what we did we did a direct transfer uh, it's also called zero shot transfer so you might have heard of zero shot one shot few shot and so on so you know we're it's basically corresponding to the number of uh, of steps you need to to train your model or to adapt the model on the target domain or target language now and so we train using bilingual embeddings in english and as i said we assume we have a big label data set in the first language and then simply apply to another language for which the bilingual embeddings also uh, containing the, the the data what is the the issues with this direct transfer approach is the difference between languages and well, and some also like technical things such as out of vocabulary words because uh, you know you, you might you might be running sort of say out of words and you encounter new words that you haven't never seen in the while creating the bilingual and wedding corpus and then basically your model would fail because you cannot look it up so you have some words that doesn't exist in your bilingual embeddings um, dictionary and there are other issues uh, for this simple approach as we just saw like modeling using the context is the syntactic ordering so you know different languages have different syntax even more the differences could be like super complicated for different pairs of languages but for example german and english like a clear example is uh, the different word ordering so you might struggle with that in this model so you might be wondering how do we create this uh, multi-link bilingual embeddings in the first place so how do we how do we create them uh, and one naive approach could be that uh, okay let's have uh, monolingual embeddings for two languages now in our example would be english and german and let's have a dictionary and we can translate German word to English and just simply assign them the embeddings of the English word or we can you know, take these two for each word basically concatenate these word embeddings or make an average so we would end up from two languages uh, and this dictionary mapping of each word to another word we would end up with the bilingual uh, embedding dictionary or uh, embedding lookup table but as you might see like the bottleneck is the dictionary so we need the dictionary in the first place which might be easy for some languages such as english and german you might have it somewhere on the internet maybe you know dictionary or duden or i don't know like other resources but it's still the bottleneck and if you don't have the word in the dictionary you're stuck you have you don't know what to do because you cannot really transfer through this dictionary and map the words together so there are some attempts to do it more in a more clever way and find uh, some better though costly solutions that might somehow mitigate a need for the dictionary in the first place so one example could be uh, from thomas mickle of 2013 is uh, the article exploiting similarities among languages for machine translation and what they have was a was a dictionary of uh, monolingual embeddings and again you know, uh, uh, the dictionary and here we would have a uh, cat and table and so on so this is a classical dictionary it doesn't solve the problem of the dictionary in the first place but it solves another problem such we just we will see but let's start with the example so we had this cat and table and now we have uh, monolingual vectors so each word would be uh, now very simplified three-dimension uh, embedding vector so this would be our uh, first language and second language and we want to find some transformation between these two languages so we can map the entire vector space of one language to another space so here we are minimizing some distance between each word so we are basically this is a, a, an objective function or function we want to minimize and to find such parameters so this would be the transformation you know, some matrix w the transformation that for each word from one language uh, 
and in another language we would minimize the distance so what is this this is the l2 norm and which is square root of uh, xy minus zy square so we're minimizing the distance and we are learning by this minimization we're learning the matrix and this matrix then will be helpful once we learn this we can map any language x word so any sorts language word into the space of language z so basically when we treat words as vectors we would learn uh, the project matrix from one vector space to another vector space and we can see it as a projection from 3d to 2d or you know from another one 3d to another 3d such as in computer graphics so we're basically projecting two spaces to to each other and where's the advantage of this approach is that we can project words that we don't have in the dictionary in the first place so you know if there's some point in the space so we have uh, we have this space and projecting to another space we can project words for which we didn't have any translation in the dictionary so this is uh, one benefit of this approach so bilingual embeddings have been a, a hot research topic in the ACL community and uh, there are some cool research um, survey research papers one is from 2016 by Upad Day uh, et al uh, at ACL and um, more recent one is from uh, from Goran Glavash from Mannheim 2019 and we will have a look at two another approaches to bilingual embeddings from from this first survey in the next slide and one of them is a by skip so it takes sentences and uh, word aligned texts so here's an example of word aligned text so we have two languages one is here french and another here is uh, english for which we know the alignment of each words so we know how they relate to each other and it takes the idea of uh, of word to vec or uh, or skipper model and basically uh, treats the context from both languages as something we would want to predict so for example for for the input love uh, we are predicting the con the full context from both languages such as i je tu in you oh my french is terrible i don't speak french i'm sorry but the idea is like well we we take all these words and uh, predicting the context and again the idea is the same distributional representation by predicting similar context we get a similar word embeddings so this is all nice but it needs the the, the aligned sentences in the first place which might be quite hard to, to to construct there could be also some approaches which don't need any supervision but another pretty cool approach is this by uh, vcd from uh, ivan vulic and marie franz moins uh, bilingual word embeddings from non power documents align data applied to bilingual lexicon induction which goes even farther in the in the amount of non-supervision they employ so given just aligned documents so just wikipedia articles for example by align we mean uh for example two documents uh, about the same topic but in two languages so it could be you know darmstadt uh, in English and in um, and in French and we know it for example from Wikipedia this these two documents are aligned ready to each other but that's it that's all they know uh, all they need and this approach would merge these documents then random shuffle all words so making like very crazy shuffling of that and then simply run a monolingual model so here you know the the same example as before bonjour je, je t'aime hello you're uh, how are you i love you it's not from that i don't think it's from wikipedia at all so it's uh, as an example right and basically you would take all these doc all these words randomly merge them and shuffle and then run simple uh context slide back of words or glove or skibram or whatever you want and it still works it's pretty it's pretty awesome it's it works 
although you only say these two documents are you know similar but with plenty of data it will learn meaningful contextualize embeddings how do we find the bilingual mappings for example from the for the biscape or other uh, as i said interlingual links in wikipedia so you're using some external supervision from from wikipedia where articles are linked together and the alignments could be learned so the word elements as we saw in the first example could be learned from some parallel corpora though this approach introduced some some error as well because aligning words might you know it's not like 100 percent trivial or 100 percent sure for many languages so there will be some uh you know some extra issues involved here but why stop at two languages when we have plenty of them so how about three and five and ten languages and so on it used to be much less explored topic uh, where some some works in 2016 2017 took the previous approaches we just talked about and extend them to you know from basecape to multiscape or bcca to multi-cca and so on so these are the the bilingual methods and these would be the multilingual methods however in 2018 2019 uh, the BERT uh, contextualized embeddings uh, came came out and they came with also like multilingual capabilities and these are pretty awesome because they have an embedding space a joint space for over 100 languages so you know you can you can do bilingual embeddings which is cool but if you have a tool that covers like 100 plus languages it's really something it's a it's a game changer could be for many tasks and it is in fact we'll be talking about multilingual bird in um, in the later lectures still these bilingual or multilingual embeddings are are important they they have their place and um, and challenges as well and the challenge is using as few resources as possible and having as little alignment as or as little supervision as possible so for example only 10 aligned word pairs and could be even punctuation so really very few signal and from there you would learn the bilingual embeddings and the mappings and go for even like machine translation which is unsupervised and this is super cool like you don't need a parallel corpus in the first place you learn every, everything just by having two corpora somehow and and uh, map them and create everything unsupervised it comes with a lot of error but just it saves so many resources and um, and it's really really challenging and it's it's pretty cool so one of these examples is this 27 uh, 2017 paper learning bilingual word embeddings with almost no bilingual data and the idea is if we if we had a dictionary we can get bilingual embeddings as we just saw but the other way around works as well if we had bilingual embeddings we can get a dictionary so why not combine these two worlds in an iterative method and we'll start with a lexicon which is some c lexicon could be even few pairs as we just saw five or ten then using the uh, the current lexicon we would learn bilingual embeddings and it could be some standard uh, word to egg and so on then we would use that to get a better lexicon using these bilingual embeddings and repeat and that works pretty well so because you need very few c lexicons and you know iteratively you learn better both lexicons and bilingual embedded we're continuing our embedding zoo and now moving from bilingual embeddings back to more linguistically motivated embeddings which is which takes uh, syntax into account and we will we'll be talking about syntactic word embeddings so the problem with the standard word embeddings is that the context or the way they learn from the context actually is a back of words or just it ignores the word order and as we see in this example well word order matters um you know to some extent it matters a lot here where where there's a huge difference between whether the dog bites a man or the man 
bites a dog. It's a creepy example, but it serves the purpose here. So it matters and we want to maybe take it into account while learning the, the word embeddings. So you remember word to wick makes no distinction between left and right context. And there's no distinction between the close or the far context. So everything is alike. So the skip rim would be, uh, you know, the bites man and, uh, bites dog. So man, we wouldn't know what it, what, what it is. Is it like the, who is biting whom? And we would ignore it and we would learn something, you know, very generic. So why not taking the, the position into account and have something like bites and dog minus one would say, okay, uh, this is the target word and this is the, the previous word. And the man is the word after. So, you no, know, this comes here. And then here, bytes a man is position minus one to the target word. So, this is here. And bytes dog plus one. So, we can somehow disambiguate a you know, the, the position. And uh, it would help us to learn some more syntactic information about it. Although we don't want to add these indices to the word, we would just need it for the, you know, we would uh, use it just for the learning. And it's a very sort of simple or um, easy extension of the basic skip model. Because remember, we have the, the contextual words and, you know, they are the same. But by simple extension, taking into account you know, it's a structured skip brain model. So taking into account the position of the, of the context, we can learn much better embeddings because we do distinguish between what's before, what's after and where it is. So the bottom line is that word representation with positional information works better slightly. It really depends. Uh, it for, for some linguistic tasks or more low level tasks such as part of speech tagging or parsing, having these information from structure skibram helps because if you look at a neighbors of breaking in a standard skibram model, you know, you would have different word forms, uh, break, string, broke, you know, different tenses and, and so on. While in structured skibram, we will see it's all uh, the ing form, you know, the gerundium, putting, turning, sticking, pulling, picking, and so on. So obviously having such, uh, such context in the embedding helps in in these tasks like part of switch taking and parsing so this comes from the from the 2015 knuckle paper however we might also want to deal with long dependencies so not like on a very close uh, context of the target word but also something which is you know far away uh, and for example here, a tea, milk, beer, coffee, uh, they all can be an object of a verb drink. And words that share syntactic relations might be distant in a sentence. And here is a cool example of uh, how distant they could be. Uh, words that have some syntactic relations to each other. So here's, an, here's a sentence. I would like to drink a very hot, tall, decaf, half soy, and then, you know, plug whatever you want. Uh, something white chocolate mocha. Uh, so it sounds like an, an order from, uh, from Starbucks. So you can have like these billion thousand options in between yet, you know, you want to capture the drink and mocha. So this is a, this is the object of this verb. Uh, it's far away. It's long dependence here, but, uh, you want to capture that somehow. And how you want to capture these dependencies, it's called <laughs> Uh, surprise, surprise, dependency parsing. So uh, let me let me give an example in one slide. So dependency parsing, uh, as opposed to s um, constituency parsing of the syntax tree we know from, uh, from grammar school, is that we map relation between words in a sentence. And here's an example, uh, which might be somehow confusing for computers as well. It's called the issue is called PP attachments issue or PP is a prepositional phrase attachment. And here's a sentence. Scientists study whales from space and we want to 
create arcs between uh, dependent words. So study scientists who study what whales, study from uh, space and uh, where from. So here's here's the from. So scientists study whales from space. Me, this meaning is, I guess, the correct meaning that the scientists study whales using some satellite photography or whatever. So something you know from very very far away. And here, the other example where the prepositional phase, uh, phrase uh, may cause issues for, well, sometimes it's too ambiguous even for, for humans to understand, or you can use it for making a joke as well, or making a pun in a, in a, in a headline of, an, of a news bar article, for example. So here, this, uh, it would read, scientists study whales from space, and here the whales from space would be like a sort of whales, you know, scientists study some whales that come from space, uh, which might be funny or not, but it shows the example of the ambiguity of PP attachments. Nevertheless, dependency parsing is, uh, you know, a tool or uh, a formalism of creating dependency between words. And we want to utilize it for word embeddings as well. So, uh, what we need to do to start with dependency-based embeddings is to have the dependencies first. So let's come back to our uh, to our example sentence. I would like to drink a very hot, tall, decaf, half soy, blah, 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 white chocolate mocha. And we would run it through a dependency parser. So this is a tool that will do the, the hard working of these you know, uh, arcs for us and come up with something like that, which is basically saying like, uh, okay, like, I, excuse me, and uh, so the li linking those two words like target and, and source. So for example, here, the last one, the object uh, is a direct object of drink is mocha. And this is what we wanted. This is like to link these two words. So there is in the output, there is this relation. So the direct object of the verb phrase is the noun phrase, which is the like here's the object of the word. So this is the linguistic explanation of direct object. So having these, uh, having this output, um, let's start doing some embeddings on that. So we would take this uh, output of the of the dependency parser as the context. So we don't take, so for example, for for uh, for the drink word, we don't take just the, the context here, but we take the, the context of the embeddings. So for the drink, we would have all the dependencies we got from, from the dependency parser. So it could be I, uh, and this is uh, the type of the dependency is a noun subject, to uh, mocha, which is the object as we just saw, like, and so on. And this would be the, the, the dependency where, on which you would just run some standard um, word to work or other embedding training procedures and end up with uh, with different word embeddings. So while word to work finds word that associate with other words, then deep uh, these dependence embeddings find words that behave like others. So there is a functional similarity versus the domain similarity. And here's some examples from, so for example, uh, Hogwarts. And for back of word, we would have uh, Malfoy and Snape. So these are the characters from Harry Potter, I guess. While for the dependency, we would have something, I don't know any of these words, Kellerts, Milfeld, are there cities? I don't know. I, I'm not good at Harry Potter. But Another example here is the Florida, so it may be it might be easier. So back of words would give you uh, something related to Florida, such as Tampa, so a city in Florida, Jacksonville, Gainesville could be another city in Florida. While the dependency uh, dependency based embeddings would give you uh, so these are near words, right? Would give you other states like Texas, Louisiana, Georgia, California. So it has a different, different uh, functionality. I mean, all these are some states, and you might guess why they are here. Because if these are, for example, objects in a sentence, they would be, they would have different, um, the same context. But it can also uh, 
turn bad somehow like for example here uh turing i i guess is alan turing uh, the computer the famous computer scientist so he's assigned in standard word uh, word to work with computability or finite state computers or non-deterministic makes sense these are somehow you know from the domain relation while <laughs> the, de the dependencies are uh, are just bad you know pulling hodling heading uh, lessing hemming okay richard hemming these are uh, another computer scientist you know it from the hemming distance but you know it's just it doesn't make sense you're right so in some con you know in some cases it works well because it gives you some functional relationships but for some words it can just go bad and we're moving to the last part of the embedding zoo today and this is the potpourri so what is left <laughs> but it's still interesting um, because there are some cool applications the main idea of uh, of these things that we are going to talk about is that well embeddings could be of you can embed other things than just words so why only words why to stop there why not go down or 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 high so we can learn embeddings of of characters like each of them could be characterized where this could be important or helpful well maybe some in domains where uh, we don't we have a lot of all we uh, all the vocabulary words such as i don't know social media you know a lot of spelling errors a lot of new language and so on so you might benefit from actually you know go to the character level and then you can go to syllables inside full or morphemes so taking uh taking the root and uh, then the suffix so insightful would be inside plus full helping so you know the root and in greedily or some German word Dampfschifffahrt, which you would split into Dampfschiff and Fahrt, and learn the embedding for each of them individually. And then this could be helpful for some morphologically rich languages like German, so Dampfschifffahrt. Uh, I'm not sure if you learn a lot of, um, uh, if you find corpus with a lot of occurrences of these words to, to, to learn good uh, contextualized embeddings, but you might. Do better with splitting that uh, other languages like morphologically rich so the czech language um, yes uh, i agree like doing some uh, some limitation or splitting the words into morphemes or syllables might be helpful and or you can go even higher and uh, you know learn and em embed basically some part of speech text or synsets lexemes super senses and the sky is your limit sort of you know and not all of them work of course however one one very very if uh, i would say famous and very helpful approach is uh, embedding engrams and in particular character engrams and this is uh, the approach that is used by fastex which is uh, which was introduced 2017 by uh, I guess it's Piotr Boyanovsky and Thomas Mikolov was one of these uh, call one of his co-authors and it appeared in the Tekel uh, I guess it's Facebook Facebook research and they made it public so you could download Fastex embeddings and use them for your work so how how they work is that you take a character engrams so basically for let's say we have a word where so we would split it into you know we, we and so on so on so three yeah these are three grams so we would take all the three grams and then learn embeddings for all n grams and then we would represent a word so when we want to construct so we would learn basically here embedding for this and this so basically all these combinations would create our vocabulary and embeddings and it's limited so if you think like 27 characters or even like 30 characters uh 30 power 3 would be our you know it's 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 not that big and you would learn for each of these words an embedding and then how we do you collect embedding for this word could be typically like taking a sum of these and maybe averaging you know by five what is the big advantage of that 
is that you don't you don't have well the risk of having out of vocabulary words is very small very limited because you can basically you would encounter encounter all of these uh, character engrams in your training corpus so it also counts for spelling mistakes so you know length spelling because you still learn meaningful signal from from the other character engrams and maybe you don't have this or you have this in your you know in your embedding corpus but if you don't that's fine because you still learn something from the context and it also works naturally for the the morphologically rich languages such as german or czech and so on so um, it's a it's a really cool approach actually so now we are talking about how to create word embeddings, but then what you do with the word embeddings once you have them, how do you use them in your task, uh, whatever the task is. We, well, we actually had an example on the part of speech text, right? But now we have these word embeddings learned and uh, the question is, what do we, we plug them into the network in the first layer of the network? And we have two options. So either do nothing. So we plug the embeddings in and let them live, well, let them stay. So we would map each word, uh, each word ID and get the vector from the embedding matrix. And then we keep the embedding mat matrix uh, untouched and only train the rest of the network. So basically we would have here the input. Uh, these would be the words for each word we would look up the embeddings. So embeddings, we would have these long vectors here and it goes to our, to our deep learning model. Very ugly, but you get a gist. So we keep them untouched. We just, we don't do anything, but we can, right? Because these are parameters of the model as well. We can treat them as well. So we can adjust the word representation to the task. Right. So when we train our model and do some web propagation, we don't stop here, but we go back here to the embeddings and we just update them as well. And they get updated in the database as well. So we update them as we train our model for the task. And for example, for a sentiment classification, you know, we can train vectors to represent positive and negative polarity for each word. Exactly. So we have um what I'm trying to say here is that we might want to update the sentiment of these words while, while we're training for the sentiment analysis task here you know so there would be like binary classification positive or negative and by back propagation and through learning the weights including the embeddings we would learn a uh, sentiment of each words which we didn't know before but there's a catch and the catch here is that that words that are seen in the training data while we are updating the word vectors, the embeddings, they move because we're updating them. But words that are not seen in the training, they just remain where they are because we don't have any signal for them. So here is an example of, uh, of two dimensional word embedding space, so very simplistic. And these are uh, words associated with some sentiment. And I guess this is positive and the red one would be negative and this is before training so before training so this is our database of embeddings right and we have some prior information on them and tv or tele and television all indicate some negative sentiment in the data set so that's why we are here uh, as as a as a red guys and they also have similar vectors because we we train we pre-train the embeddings you know, and they have similar meanings and similar functions so they they are close to each other. And now, what if TV and tele occur in the training data, but television not? So television could be in test data, but let's say these two are in the training data. What happens then? What happens? So this is again the the before training. And what happens? when TV and tele have been updated. So they move somewhere in the space. We don't know where it, it, they move depending on the objective that they trained on. So there might be moving somewhere and tele is moving somewhere as well. But television, we don't see it in training data. So it just stays there. And what happened then could be that TV and tele move far away 
somewhere, you know, because they get updated from here to here and from here to here. And the context is also changing of them. And we're losing the information that tell it TV and television are the same thing. And they should be treated not only like uh, semantically similar, but they, they should have the same function uh, with respect to the end task. So they should be all, television should be negative as well. You know, they should give some signal of negativity for sentiment analysis. But as we updated telly and TV here, we lost that. And television now could be a signal for something which is positive because it just stay where it was while the whole space somehow may be rotated or were updated you know, or the points in there. So um, it might be helpful to update them, but there could be some, some disadvantages of doing that. So the practical tips would be then if you have a large, 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 large training corpus, then update them, you know. You can you can trade the bird embeddings, and then even that it might not be useful. So the uh, you know what we what we see in the research papers, uh, the evidence is really it's it varies. It's it's very different from task to task. So there is no clear saying like do this or don't do this. It might be working for your task, but there's no guarantee. Uh, one common practice would be like training the vectors only for a few epochs and then keep them fixed. So it learns something about the task, but not that much. So they, they don't distort the embedding space that much. If if you're in doped, just keep them. Just don't don't change them. Keep them as they are. And learn better transformation in the actual neural network. So which brings me to the end of this uh, word embedding zoo to the summary. And what all these embedding approaches have to have in common they they try to overcome the sparsity of, of uh, vocabulary approaches, one hot encoding and so on, by representing natural language input with real valued vectors. You know, so this is mapping from from discrete space to some continuous space. They have different units of representation. So we might we start with words, but we might go down to morphemes or even characters such as in fast text or we can actually learn embeddings of uh, maybe phrases or even sentences or documents you know we actually might learn uh, representation of, of sentences which is a vector and it, it works for some tasks so we'll be having actually um, a guest lecture of sentence embeddings later on given by Neil, uh, given by Niels Heimus and another well, there are different contexts used for training. So not only, you know, not only uh, the, the neighborhood, but we also saw there is some you know, positional embeddings or even like dependency based. But for that, you need much more pre-processing and it could be super costly. And here's a here's a set sad news well it's a good news and sad news so the the world of nlp is changing super fast and we're static word embeddings as we know them as we just talked about them they had a huge impact on the, on the deep learning for nlp field because they showed like how can you learn something meaningful unsupervised I have to say, you know, it, it didn't start with word embeddings, all this mapping words to vectors. It's actually the idea is, you know, older and goes back to at least 1990s with uh, approaches such as, I guess, HAL or QALS or other, you know, um, vector spaces for words. But they were learned in different, in different means and they didn't perform for end task that well as word to vec did, you know, just from scratch. Uh, maybe it was a bit of luck because word to vec uh, really worked well because it had really some well-chosen hyperparameters for training. It was shown later if you do well with these old methods from the you know 1990s to 2000s as well, you can you can get some comparable results. But word to, you know word to vec was really game changer. Another game changer, but came in uh, 2018, 2019, which is the contextualized embeddings, uh, such as BERT or ELMO. And now these are the main mainstream in, um, in NLP, so to be used for representing input as a, as a word embeddings. 
So the standard statics or embeddings are becoming extinct now for end to end task, but they still play a, a role in in some contexts. For example, learning something about uh, the words, you know, about the language. If you if you want to go into some linguistic insights, for example. So we'll be talking about BERT um, later on in these lectures. I guess for today that's it, and um, uh, thanks for watching. If you have any comments uh, uh, or any any. Uh, if you see any, any bug fixes needed, then drop us a line or just go to the GitHub and just open the issue there. We'll super appreciate it. Here's a bunch of references here. So just download the PDF and look at these references I was citing here. And hope to see you next time. Thanks a lot.